So um, without, so he popped up on my screen, being recorded, got it. Yes. Um, okay. So let's hope this works. There we go. So I'm just going to start with a quick uh, indigenous land acknowledgements. Acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrieliano Togas people. And I recognize that these peoples were forced to be removed from their homelands. I'd also like to take this opportunity to um, publicly express solidarity with the brave women of Iran, support for the defiant protesters, including fellow academics and students in and outside Iran. And I think this is trying moments for many of our colleagues and students that we know. So I hope you all show support. Um, I'd like to thank uh, David Shadak and Shantanu Joshi for, uh, for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm very happy to exchange with you and I'll be here also during the afternoon and happy to meet also more people. So very briefly, what I uh, prepared for today's talk is a, a quick uh, overview of what the neuro AI field is and what it looks like. Many of you have heard of this and I'd just like to go and give a brief overview. And then I'll tell you a few words about this new center we created in Quebec a couple of years ago, uh, which is called the Unique Center. It's the Quebec Neuro AI Research Center. Um, and then I'll go over some discussions and debates concerning hypothesis driven versus data driven, which has become a question uh, of increasing importance in the age of AI and data driven research. Um, I will take a few minutes to uh, give an overview of some of the basics of machine learning just to make sure that we're all on board and there might be some people or some students that are unfamiliar with uh, some what actually machine learning entails. So that's going to be very brief. Um, and then I hope I have some time to go into a number of just selected studies from uh, my lab, which is the COCO lab for cognitive and computational neuroscience lab. So first of all, this um, convergence between biological and machine intelligence. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware that um, the original inspiration for artificial intelligence is biological intelligence. So the direction goes from brain inspiring AI development. So this is brain inspired AI. But then the, the other direction is how AI can help uh, brain science and neuroscience. Um, so this is AI powered uh, brain science. Um, I will focus more on the, the second direction in this talk today, but we are also developing research in the lab where we try to come up with um, using AI as models um, and trying to improve what we can do with AI based on better inspiration from the brain. So machine learning as a tool to advance our understanding of brain dysfunction and function. So there are many ways that AI can help neuroscience. Um, Broadly, uh, we can split them in at least two uh, main directions, either as a tool to reverse engineer the brain, to understand the workings and how, uh, if we use AI as models, can we better understand what the brain is actually doing to solve tasks? Um, and secondly, as a data mining tool, so more of a statistical learning type approach. Um, you're probably familiar with, uh, a, there's a new stream of research that started about five to maybe five to eight years ago, where there's increasing work that tries to compare representations, neural representations in machines and in biology. So for example, example, comparing the processing of information across the visual stream from V1 over to more specialized areas, um, both so from, from a, an electrophysiological perspective, for example, using data from, from primates. Um, and then on the other hand, training an, uh, an artificial intelligence um, to so basically uh, um, an, an ANN, an artificial neural network, to do the same task. And then when we have that, we can go in looking at the, these, these different layers and then compare them and look at similarities and uh, discrepancies between the two as a way to tap into um, the uh, basic building blocks of, uh, of intelligence. Um, yeah, there's many studies. I won't have time to go into details. Um, the other approach is using AI as a data mining tool for neuroscience. Um, you've probably heard of the, 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 the terminology brain encoding and brain decoding. Um, and so um, machine learning has proven over the last 10 years to be a very useful tool in addition to the classical tools that we have to probe the brain and try to understand the neural underpinnings of cognition. So what we do in our lab is we use a, a range of tools and techniques, including brain imaging techniques, behavioral measures, signal processing, machine learning, to address a wide range of questions, um, including uh, states of consciousness, sleep, dreams, episodic memory, decision-making, sustained attention, creativity, psychiatric disorders, and many more. The, the, um, the basic principle is always the same. Um, these brilliant uh, people in my lab, what they do is they use these, uh, the array of tools and techniques that I just described 
ranging from uh, imaging techniques to signal processing tools and machine learning, and then apply them to address a wide variety of questions in cognitive neuroscience. And in general, we focus on tools that come from um, electrophysiological human brain recordings, invasive and non-invasive, that is MEG, EEG, and intracranial EEG. But we also have uh, ongoing collaborations with, uh, with labs using other techniques. So the principle is the following, we record brain activity during tasks or during resting state. And based on these recordings, we try to infer, um, we answer questions in cognitive neuroscience, systems neuroscience, or uh, clinical neuroscience. So just to give you an overview of the breadth of the projects that are ongoing in general, what we do in the lab is we record MEG EEG or intracranial EEG, or we use existing databases. And then we use advanced signal processing techniques on the data. And we feed these, uh, the data either as raw signals or as um, handcrafted features into a machine learning uh, framework to either decode, classify, or predict a number of things. We're looking at decision-making tasks, motor intentions. Um, we have a study where we're looking at different types of meditation states, Vipassana um, and um, looking at Vipassana and Samatha, for instance. Um, we also use this to look at sleep stages and how brain activity changes across sleep stages. We have an, an, a nice study about dream recall that I'll hopefully um, describe in more detail later. We're looking at using these uh, tools to decode or identify individuals from their brain signals. And of course, we are using this to look at uh, brain disorders, among other things, schizophrenia. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this. So very briefly, this um, Unique is the uh, Neuro AI Research Center that we created in 2019. So it's still very young. And we just, uh, a few months ago, we got the renewal for the next six years from, for funding. So, so that's something we're really excited about. And what this is, it basically stems from the idea that, uh, or from the observation, let's say, that there's tremendous progress in AI. Um, and one has to admit that we're still very far from human level intelligence. Um, so, for example, the ability that kids have to generalize across tasks, if they learn to use, uh, for example, a hammer on one day for in a given task, the child will be able on the second day to just use that same hammer, but in a different condition. There's a, there's a form of one shot generalization that uh, our, some of our most sophisticated algorithms in AI are still not capable of doing. Um, and so one of the, the ways to try and improve the state of the art is for better convergence between neuroscience and AI. Um, and um, there is more and more interest actually in beyond this bi-directional collaboration to actually uh, propose some fusion between the two fields. And now we have increasingly um, researchers, but also students that come into this field of neuro AI, ideally bilinguals who would equally be at ease using machine learning algorithms and developing AI tools and asking um, neuroscience questions and understanding the neuroscience literature. So in the center that I'm currently heading, we have 60 regular researchers from eight academic institutions across Quebec, 30 collaborating members from Quebec and internationally uh, from different universities, as you can see on the left side is, is the list. Um, and I'd encourage you to find out more about our center. It's unique.quebec uh, and we're also obviously on, on, on social media. Uh, we have also uh, been um, promoting neuroscience AI interface at the um, federal level, so at the Canadian level through the Canadian Brain Research Strategy that is led by Yves de Conac. Um, and there also, there are gonna be six important initiatives and one of them is promoting neuro AI and how can that help uh, both for basic research but also for clinical applications. Okay, enough said about unique. Now, um, I said I'll, I'll briefly um, touch upon the question of this maybe false debate uh, between data-driven and hypothesis-driven research. Um, in many cases, we're always manipulating data. And even if we're doing, um, if, if we're doing hype, you know, um, data-driven research or hypothesis-driven research, there's always data involved. And so it's not quite clear what happened. And actually, I think what happened is that we moved on from the ice age to the age of AI and machine learning and big data. And so what changed is that now we have much more data than access to much more data than we had before. And computational power has increased. And this has led to a renaissance of AI. Many of the most powerful algorithms that we are using today were available quite some time ago, but they were not able to, we were not able to use them at their fullest uh, potential because of either not sufficient computational power or not sufficient data. And so now this has led to, this, um, to the rise of a new field that we all know as data science. And we can ask the question, does this mean that now we're just gonna throw all our data to the machines and let them solve all the problems for us? Um, or is this the room for hypothesis driven research? So we'll come back to that question later. But one important distinction I think that needs to be made is um, how does 
using a machine learning algorithm to classify two states or controls versus patients. How does that compare to uh, just using our conventional statistical approaches? Um, and I think here is important to remember that um, machine learning is a form of statistical learning. Uh, so there are some relationships between the two and some similarities, but there are also differences between the two. Uh, most notably, when we're using classical statistics, we're doing in samples. So we have a full sample of individuals or of data and we apply our, our tools to them. Um, so we seek to reject a null hypothesis by considering the entirety of the, of the data sample. What we do generally in machine learning is that we try to infer the rules from a subset of the data. And then we apply the decision function that has been learned from that data to new data that has not been used to learn those rules. This is why we talk about out of sample generalization. So in other words, if you can train your model to di differentiate between a patient and a control, you would want to test it on a new person that comes into the lab and you record data and you just apply that model and it should be able to tell you whether it's a patient or a control, um, if it was able to learn and do what we call out of sample generalization. And so there seems to be like this, this false debate in the field. I think these two methods uh, are not really in, directly in competitions. They're slightly different. And some of you might recognize this from a video back in the 80s um, or 90s, I can't remember, yeah, 80, 87, this is new order, true faith. On the left-hand side, we are using in sample. So this is what you, this is, this is inferential statistics. So this includes methods for correlation like Pearson experiment, chi-square, comparison of means, one-known t-test, and regression and non-parametric approaches. And when we talk about out of sample, this is where uh, we're talking about machine learning. So um, if you're interested in this relationship between these two things and what could be the advantage of one over the other, depending on your application, I'd highly recommend this paper by Danilo Buzdok, uh, published in Frontiers in 2017. So uh, maybe one uh, thing to, to keep in mind is that conventional statistical analysis of data um, and machine learning classification are two conceptually different approaches. Uh, and so depending on what you want to do, you might want to use one or the other. It's not about which one is best. So very briefly, I said there'll be a, a very brief overview of what machine learning is, and I hope I'm not going to offend anyone by explaining the basics. For those of you who know all about this, this is probably the time to check your email or your Twitter feed. Um, so um, first, first of all, there's a mess in the nomenclature. So many of you have heard about the successes of AlphaGo from DeepMind or the AlphaFold. Um, so um, the way this is reported also in the, um, in the media is also blurs a bit the line. So we wonder what was it that helped uh, um, the AlphaGo algorithm beat uh, the world's best player of Go, Lee Siddall? Is it artificial intelligence? Was it machine learning that helped him do that? Or is it uh, deep learning? And so just to set the stage, it is important to, to keep in mind that the, uh, the main field, the, the larger field is artificial intelligence. Within that, there's a subfield we call machine learning. So machine learning is part of AI. And then within machine learning, so machine learning is um, basically a tool that has been increasingly used since the 80s. And this is typically what's sorting out the incoming mail into your mailbox and telling you whether this is spam or a useful um, uh, email that you should uh, probably look into. And that's based on training of the model and a lot, a lot of data, including a lot of spam. And then that sort of just does this, uh, this classification for you. Um, now, within the field of machine learning, there's artificial neural networks. And within artificial networks, there is what we call uh, deep learning. And you've probably heard a lot about this and its successes in many domains. So once again, it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, artificial neural networks, and then deep learning. So as I said, the, uh, the rise of these tools um, have led to, to, uh, to a field or, or, or a piece of discipline we hear a lot about called we call data science, which is basically a mixture uh, of, of many fields in science converging, including domain expertise, data engineering, scientific methodology, mathematics, statistics, advanced computing, visualization tools, and a hacker mindset. Um, and it's not really clear to everyone what actually data science this is. For sure, it's something that you'd put on your LinkedIn page if you're looking for a job nowadays. Um, so machine learning, just to give a very broad definition, and this is again aimed, sorry for those who know all about this already, um, at its most basic uh, definition is the fact of using algorithms to parse data, learn from the data, and then make a determination or a prediction about something in the world. Um, so the difference here is rather than hard coding the, 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 um, the rules, we actually give data to the machine and we, most of the time, if it's supervised learning, we, we label the data and then we let the machine 
um, guess or identify a rule that will then apply to new data. So how this works, you have training data, you train a classifier with this trainer, training data. And then what you do is you have your test set and you feed that to your model and then you look at the prediction, how well it performs. If it performs well, then you've managed to achieve uh, out of sample generalization. Um, just to give you an example, you can, do, you can use these algorithms, for example, to classify between uh, different styles of music uh, by using the, the audio signals. Uh, so you train on a large data set of jazz versus punk music, for instance, and then you'll um, bring in new data sets and then let your classifier tell you based on what it learned on, from this separation where you actually gave the answer. So the labels were given. Now you're looking at what the algorithm tells you for these new data samples. Um, and it's going to guess punk, jazz, punk, jazz. And in some cases, it's, for example, this is here Thurston Moore. This is free jazz. It's going to maybe identify it as punk, let's say. So you'll have three correct answers one mistake and so this is then going to be a decoder that has a decoding accuracy i think you've all guessed this of 75 percent so now we say we have an algorithm that is able to do out of sample generalization with a performance of 75 percent um, now that was on the raw signals this can be audio signals but you can also do of course of course what we do is we extract features of this but we can also record brain signals during something like this so listening to music different styles of music looking at the brain signals and then we use these brain signals um, as features to train a model. And then we apply this model to um, brain signals that were obtained during listening to other trials out of training and see how well this works. So um, I'm going fast over this because I think this is really basics. But um, if we talk about binary classification, you'll be recording brain signals with any modality. This can be fMRI, EEG, MEG, intracranial recordings. Um, and then you extract a feature uh, vector and then you run your classifier that's going to tell you if it's class one or class two. And what it's actually doing is learning from this um, training data, it's learning to derive a decision function f. And I'm not going to go into the details of this, but I'm just going to show you one illustration that um, illustrates this. So imagine you have two features of your data. These can be two properties of the data that you can extract from your recordings. Now you have two groups, let's say an individuals that are attentive and others that are distracted. These are the yellow and the blue dots. This is the training data. This is what the algorithm sees when it's training. So if you were this algorithm and you see this, um, your task in training is to try and find a rule that will allow you to classify and, sorry, to classify and separate uh, these two. So one thing you might suggest is say, well, I think that this line here separates these dots nicely. This is obviously in 2D. In reality, you have many more features. So this is an n-dimensional space. But basically, based on the training data, an algorithm decides, OK, I think this line is a good separator for these, for these two data sets. Now, what happens in out-of-sample generalization, this is now test data. You have a new dot comes in. And now you, the algorithm that has trained and identified this function, you're going to look at this and you're going to say, well, to me, this new data point is most likely to be a, obviously, a blue dot. You might be right. You might be wrong. But this is basically how, how it works. So the way to do this is splitting the data in training and test. Uh, train a classifier. There are many algorithms out there that can do this. Then you run it on the test. So you have a training phase. And then obviously you have a test phase. And then on the test set, you look at the performance. And this is going to tell you how well your machine learning tool is able to generalize. We do this using cross validation. Why? Because you want to make sure that the result you get doesn't depend on the way you split your data into training and test. So there are many uh, approaches to make sure this is done properly. Cross validation is one of them. And there are many ways of doing cross validation. Um, one of the last things I want to touch upon in this uh, discussion about the basics of machine learning is you've probably heard about shallow versus deep learning. Shallow learning often refers to the, tr the more traditional conventional machine learning pipeline, um, where we proceed first by uh, extracting features from the data, and then we use that. So this is, you often hear the term handcrafted features, so you uh, derive the features from the data. And then uh, in deep learning, what we often do is uh, it's a lengthier, more computationally expensive machine learning pipeline where both the feature learning and the model learning are done at the same time. So this is why most of the time, not always, but most of the time deep learning approaches, you use the raw data and then the, the model tries to learn representations at the same time as it's training. Um, so you can, you can see shallow learning as feature extraction plus classification, whereas in deep learning, both are done at the same time. So um, that was a very brief overview. Uh, there are many reasons, I think, why we should be excited about the use of machine learning, um, in particular with EEG, intracranial EEG, and MEG, which are, which are the, the, the data that we are interested in. 
Um, so some of my favorites are the fact that we can use something called cross-temporal generalization. In other words, if you have high temporal resolution in your data, you can train a model at a time t and you can see how well it performs elsewhere in the data. And if it's still performing really well, it tells you that the underlying process is continuous in time. So it gives you information about the temporal dynamics of the processes that you're capturing with your machine learning uh, approach. Another thing that is really useful is feature importance. So you can do multi-feature classification, but then you can open the hood and look at the uh, coefficients or the, the contributions of all these features. And what are the features that help the algorithm perform uh, so well? Uh, and so that's very useful for interpretation. Transfer learning and domain adaptation can be very uh, practical and scientifically insightful. Um, as I said, doing um, feature learning using deep learning could also be very interesting, specifically when you're looking for maybe representations that you might not have information about a priori. So that is uh, not a hypothesis driven approach, but rather just looking what the, the, uh, the deep learning algorithm will learn in terms of representations. And then you will have the task of trying to make interpretations of that, which is sometimes not that easy. Um, and there are many tools that come with all these machine learning packages for dimensionality reduction and visualization. Um, I mentioned cross-temporal generalization already, so I'm not going to go back into, into, this, uh, into these details here. So, um, of course, there are also some pitfalls and things you need to watch out for. So you need to be very careful about overfitting your data when you're doing machine learning. Um, there's also the risk that you even sometimes, um, without really realizing it, people can fall into the trap of violating the strict uh, separation between training data and test data. Uh, imbalanced data can be uh, sometimes tricky to, to handle. In particular, this is something that often occurs in the clinical setting. Uh, sample size is important depending on the algorithms that you're using um, and also angry pandas. So the take home message from this uh, brief intro to, to machine learning and how they can be useful for us in, in, in cognitive neuroscience. Um, I think machine learning is opening up many new opportunities in all fields of research, including neuroscience. You need to know though that there's no magic. We'll, we see a lot of stuff uh, in particular with deep learning nowadays and all sorts of uh, DALI diffusion models being used to do all sorts of very cool stuff. And it is sometimes uh, easy to fall into the, uh, the trap of thinking, well, you know, it's so powerful, let's just give it the data and see what happens. So there's no magic in there. It learns rules from sometimes a lot of data. Um, I always recommend to my students to try and ignore the AI buzz and just use the best tools that address your specific questions. Sometimes you have domain knowledge that is really important to use, and if it's there, you should use it rather than just uh, throwing your data at the machine. Uh, machine learning has some nice tools, as I just mentioned, that, that can enhance your classical analysis, but also garbage in, garbage out, and bias in, bias out. So keep that in mind when you're uh, training your models. Um, and so just like rock and roll, hypothesis testing is not dead because it's also present, first of all, it's complementary to these approaches, but also when you're using machine learning approaches, you always, most of the time, you're going to go for some type of data or you're going to go for some features. By doing that, you are de facto implementing also some hypothesis into the data-driven approach. Um, I'm going to, yeah. So um, what I am now going to switch gears, um, that was a broad overview um, about uh, the convergence between neuroscience and AI some of the, uh, the new efforts that we are doing in Quebec to launch this type of uh, research between neuroscientists and AI researchers, um, and a brief overview of the basics of machine learning and why I think it can be really useful for, uh, for cognitive neuroscience research. Um, I, we have about 20 to 25 different projects going on in the lab, uh, and some, some are done, some are still ongoing, many of them are interesting. I won't have time to go through a large number, so I just chose two or three of them, and we'll see how this goes with time. Um, so, um, one research where we're doing this type of, of analysis, that is recording brain data and then combining the analysis with machine learning and signal processing, is looking at uh, dream recall. Uh, so, before I go into the specifics of dream recall, um, one question comes um, to mind, which is, first of all, what do we know about the neural correlates of, of, uh, of dreaming? And this is um, a field where you know, there's quite exciting um, results, but there's not much we know um, one study that was published in 2017 in Nature Neuroscience um, was based on awakening the individuals during the night um, and asking them, were you just dreaming before we woke you up? And that was one way to, because this is really difficult. How do you study dreams and how do you know people are dreaming? So one approach is wake individuals up while, while they're sleeping in the lab and then ask them, were you in the middle of the dream right now? Uh, and then if so, if yes, then you can, note, you can annotate that data segment just prior to awakening as a uh, dream segment. And if not, it's a no dream segment. 
And then you can compare the data that are recorded with these, um, these different states. Uh, and so some of the, just an example of some of the results that we're showing using EEG during sleep is that if you compare um, both actually, interestingly, in REM um, and in non-REM sleep, most of you maybe associate dreaming with, the, with REM sleep, but it has been also reported that we do dream also in non-REM stages. And in both cases, um, there's, um, there's a decrease in delta power. So these are slow oscillations between one and four hertz uh, in the posterior areas that you see here, uh, posterior cortical regions um, during uh, dream compared to, uh, to non-dream segments. Um, interestingly, the same study showed that there are some areas, uh, um, fusiform face areas in the brain that light up in the segments during dreaming where the individuals reported that they were uh, seeing faces or people in their dreams. Um, now, a slightly different question is, what about dream recall? The ability of people to remember their, their, their dreams and are there any brain activations that are associated with, these, uh, with, the, with, with dream recall? So there's previous work that we're not going to hear for the, for the, for the sake of time. Um, but um, the knowledge that we have about dream recall is quite fragmented. Um, the experiments are quite complex and there's a wide variety of different brain measurement techniques, high dimensional data. So we said, well, how, how about we uh, combine uh, EEG recordings and machine learning to try and address the difference in brain signals during sleep um, in individuals that say they remember their dreams a lot and others that say they hardly ever remember their dreams. Um, so this is the dream team that, um, of, of individuals and collaborators that worked on this project. Um, we surveyed 1,000 interested persons online and asked them about their sleep habits and their dreams. Um, and so within this group, um, we identified high dream recallers. And these are dream individuals that say they have a dream recall on more than three mornings per week. And the low dream recallers had less than two uh, less dreams. They recalled their dreams less than twice per month. And so based on this, we were, allowed, we were able to bring in um, 18 from each group into the lab. So 36 participants, they spent the night um, at the lab with, uh, sleeping with an EEG and polysomnographic recordings. Um, and then what we did is we um, took that data, computed different types of, of features from it and tried to run a classifier to see whether what type of features differentiate between these two groups, and if, if any. Um, there are many uh, types of features that one can exploit in this context. We use, among other things, spectral power, but also um, covariance matrices com computed from the EEG data and co-spectra. Um, and I'm just showing you here what happens in sleep stage N2. If we're comparing, uh, the first column here is the high dream recallers. The second one is the low dream recallers. Here is the, uh, what happens if you run a t-test on the two. And the, the, third, the fourth column um, identifies areas where the, uh, the machine learning algorithm, uh, in this case, I think an LDA uh, or an SVM, was able to, uh, to classify uh, above chance level the two groups. Uh, and so interestingly, we see that in particular, the sigma frequency, so this is alpha range, sigma range, and the beta range. These are different frequency bands in the, in the signal. Uh, and there seems to be a strong difference between the two that was successfully used by the machine learning algorithm to classify these two groups, um, indicating that during N2, during sleep, in the N2 sleep stage, um, there's, um, there are stronger um, um, activity in the sigma. This is between 12 and 16. This is typically what we refer to as a spindle range for frequency, frequency range um, for the high dream recallers compared to the low dream recallers. Um, now, um, we did the same thing, uh, just again for illustration. I'm just going to show you the same study, but now we run a convolutional neural network um, on the data um, to extract. Uh, now, in this case, we're not computing powers in different frequency ranges. We're just giving the raw EEG data to the, uh, <clears throat> to the convolutional neural network. And we get, these are, these are for the different sleep stages. You see here the decoding accuracy performance for classification of individuals with high or low dream recall. Um, more interestingly is um, one question that we ask is whether the uh, CNN is doing, so, is doing well because it's actually um, able to identify individuals rather than whether these individuals are dreamers or non-dreamers. And so to test that, we also um, developed a, um, an architecture, a CNN architecture that is actually specifically designed to identify individuals. Um, and that's what we see on the, second, um, on the second line here. So you see at the end, 
This is a TSNE representation where you can see different colors representing different individuals. So this is a separation after training. Um, and this is here the separation for dreamers. Now, um, this is the dreamer label. These, the colors here represent subject labels. And so what we need to keep in mind is this is the task that we're interested in. Moving from this and after training, we have this separation. For the individual identifications based on the EEG, we go from this to this last one over here, and we see how this works. Now, if we, if we paint the same data here with the colors of dreamers, non-dreamers, we get this. Um, and if we use the same data here now, identify the colors using the different subject labels, we get this. In other words, this is just a, a way to be sure that the algorithm was actually really separating uh, dreamers from non-dreamers and not just identifying individuals. Um, and one um, important um, point here is that often you might hear this uh, criticism to, um, to the use of deep learning in the context of brain imaging, in the context of, of cognitive neuroscience, and that is people say, well, it's a black box. So it's this very powerful tool and you can throw anything at it and it's gonna give you 86% or 95% classification accuracy, but so what? What do we do with that information? And that's a valid concern. And luckily there are now more and more approaches and tools that we can use to try and open the black box and see how did the uh, deep learning um, approach um, achieve its, its good results. And one of these approaches is called, it, is called guided back propagation. So what we do is we identify epochs that led to the, uh, the good discrimination. And then those epochs then are used for with, statistic, with classical analysis, such as, for example, spectral power analysis. So what we see here is a representation for the, five, for the four different sleep stages, REM, uh, deep sleep, N2, and awake. Um, and we apply, again, just regular uh, spectral analysis. And this allows us to identify what are the, um, the sleep stages and what uh, spectral components were um, decisive or were discriminant or were used by the deep learning algorithm. And luckily or interestingly, I mean, let's say reassuringly, we found uh, that activity in the sigma range, again, arose as being something that the deep learning picked up on without explicitly being told to search for uh, sigma activity. Okay, so to summarize this, um, the observations from the study, um, I think we showed that combining EEG and machine learning can identify brain features that distinguish high uh, dream recallers from low dream recallers during uh, night sleep. The use of artificial neural networks can bring new data-driven insights. So it can be a complement, again, to uh, just to showcase what I was saying earlier. Um, and we found that the most prominent feature, at least in our data, seems to be the sigma neural oscillation. So this is between 12 and 16 hertz um, during um, N2 sleep. Um, some of you who are familiar with the literature on sleep and on memory consolidation know that N2 sleep is important for memory consolidation. So there might be links here to be explored between what's happening here and the ability of people to remember their dreams, um, which could also explain why the most interesting results we found were not in REM, but rather in N2. Okay, um, I'm going to go now to another study. I showed you an EEG study. Now I'm going to go to an intercranial EEG study where we looked at free choice. This is a study we published um, uh, in 2020. Um, my PhD student, Thomas Thierry, did a great job on this. Um, the objective here was to try and look at the neural correlates of activations, um, oscillatory activations in different frequency bands during a free choice task. This was a free choice task where the individuals were instructed or left to choose where to perform a saccade to. So there were saccades saccade to the left or to the right. Um, in, the, um, in the instructed condition, um, they will have an arrow at the Q1 that would tell them, prepare to, to do a saccade towards the right target. But wait, don't do it yet. And then there's a go signal that comes on after a variable period of time. So it's a, it's a delayed uh, saccade task that, uh, that tells them now you can perform that saccade. In the free condition, just a diamond comes up. There is no indication of left or right. So they can choose where they want to um, do the saccade towards. And then uh, at the go signal, they would perform that. What you see down here is just the, um, the location of all the intracranial implanted electrodes across all these individuals. These are obviously uh, epilepsy patients. Um, and we excluded all the, um, the sites that had epileptic um, activity. Um, I don't have much time. So I'm just going to go over the, some of the of the main results. Um, so looking at two areas of interest, the frontal eye field here and the intraparietal uh, sulcus IPS in two participants, what you see here is time frequency maps. So across time, 
the energy in the signal across different frequencies from zero up to 120. And on Q1, this is the moment where they are told, for example, for the instructed, they, they are shown an arrow left or right. Um, in the free, there's, there's no arrow, basically it's just left or right, and then they will choose. Q2 times zero is the moment that I actually uh, execute the staccato, okay? Um, so by looking at the time frequency maps here in frontal eye field, you can see that there is strong gamma activity. Um, though this is high frequency activations above 70, 80 hertz, all the way up to 140 roughly, um, that we see when they execute the saccade, but not much is happening, although we can see traces of activity during Q1. Um, and we can just, on the right-hand side here, you see the gamma envelope. So this is all trial by trial, so it's trial sorted, and you can see um, the activations in the gamma band happening upon execution, but not on Q1. But if you now look at the intraparietal sulcus, what we can see here is even at the time of Q1, so there's no saccade happening, there's just processing of the information of where to, uh, to saccade towards. We, the, we have activations in all three cases for the instructed, the free, and the control. By the way, the control is just a case where uh, um, a box is shown, a square. Um, so they don't know what's going to be uh, the direction. They have to just wait. And on Q2, they are given the direction and they have to execute the, uh, so they can't prepare the, uh, the saccade beforehand. So in this case, is a, you're preparing an instructed saccade, while here you're actually choosing where you're going to perform the saccade. Um, and then you see here what happens on the, on the Q signal. So there seems to be a sustained, so I draw your attention to comparing these two plots here. For the free case in the IPS, there is a longer lasting gamma activity compared to the instructed case. Um, and this is what we're gonna see uh, afterwards now on the, on the uh, larger group level. So by comparing instructed versus control, uh, for, for example, if we look at this map here, we're looking at gamma activity and instructed versus control. Again, control, there's no information given uh, on the direction of the saccade. Um, and what you see here, this is now decoding accuracy using a machine learning classifier that is time resolved. So we're looking at the performance of in this case, I think it was an SVM or an LDA. We look at the performance of our classifier over time and we see the times of maximum separation between these, uh, these two conditions. Um, this is for instructed versus control, but we also can compare free versus control. Um, and what Thomas found here is that there is stronger activity and longer lasting activity in free, and that also is nicely separable. What you see on the right hand side. Now, this is, these are the, the typical temporal generalizations or cross-temporal generalization maps that I mentioned before. The nice thing about this is that you can look at, once you've trained your model, you can see that same model, you can freeze its parameters and you can launch it on data on other time points and you see how well does it do elsewhere. So for example, when you see something like this with off diagonal um, high values for this, for this um, decoding accuracy, it tells you that the phenomenon that you've captured with your, with your um, algorithm is sustained over time. So it gives you more information about the dynamics. In other words, this tells us that, the, that the, um, in the free condition, um, we are able that that phenomenon is sustained over at least what you can see here, close to a second. Um, and so that's the time probably where the, uh, where the deliberation is going on and where the individual is planning its, its, um, its cut. Um, there are many more details in the paper, uh, and I'll be happy also to answer questions later. So this is the first direct electrophysiological evidence in humans for the role of sustained high uh, gamma frequency um, in frontal parietal cortex, in mediating intrinsically driven process of freely choosing, uh, sorry, freely uh, choosing among competing behavioral alternatives. Um, and um, the ML-based technique that we use uh, using temporal generalization provides insights into the, the, the temporal dynamics of the underlying processes. Um, I have one last, uh, now I gave one example with EEG, one with intracranial EEG, so now I'm going to talk about MEG. Um, and here again, we use machine learning, applied it to MEG data, now in a more of a clinical context. Um, in this case, we're looking at uh, schizophrenia uh, patients. So this is a study led by my uh, former PhD student, Golnush Alamian in the lab, and in collaboration with the Cardiff group, with Kubrick, and in particular, Krish Singh. Um, so this is where published in uh, Neuroimage in 2020. Um, I'll just run you through some of the main uh, results we reported here. So the MEG data was recorded in 25 uh, patients, uh, schizophrenia patients, and 25 control patients. The, um, we had resting state data, so this was not an active task. So just five minutes of recording of this MG data. Um, 
we uh, explored a, a large array of features. I'm just showing three here, spectral power and different frequency ranges. Um, we use detrended fluctuation analysis to compute what we call long range temporal correlations. And we computed multi-factor coefficients um, that we will not describe in, in, in much detail. We use supervised machine learning. Uh, and in this case, it was um, a support vector machine, both using single and multi-feature classifiers. Um, so, uh, if we look at the sensor level results, uh, first of all, we were pleased to see that our results replicate previous findings in EEG, where we see that there is a suppression um, of these um, DFA scaling exponents in the um, schizophrenia group compared to uh, two controls. Uh, but because this is MEG and we can go further than just looking at what's happening in sensor space, we can use um, source reconstruction methods um, to try and uh, map the activations to the brain area. So what we see here is for um, four different frequency uh, bands from uh, gamma, beta, alpha, and theta. For the patients, we see distribution of the DFA exponents. We see the same thing for the controls and here the T values. Um, so we see that again, that this is a strong suppression of the um, uh, a decrease in the uh, LRTC. And the results of, uh, of a classifier here allow you to identify what brain areas in different frequency bands here in the alpha and the beta show, uh, allow the algorithm to classify between controls and patients. Um, again, the idea here is that this is done on out of sample generalization. So it's something that you know, if, you, if, you, if another patient or subject would come into the lab, you'd apply that same model and it would have this roughly 70 to 80% um, uh, level of accuracy in classifying. And most importantly, it's identifying for us, what are the features? Because th this is based on a statistical analysis across the result, the decoding accuracies we obtained across the whole brain, right? So by doing this, you can focus, you identify, okay, these areas are statistically significant, not in the sense of a t-test, but the decoding accuracies that your machine learning algorithm gave you. If you run them against a null hypothesis where you just permute all your data, you run your machine learning algorithms over and over again, it tells you these areas here are where there are significant differences that the algorithm was able to use successfully to, uh, to classify individuals. Uh, I'm just, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, skip over this. So um, there's a drop in long range temporal correlation in schizophrenia. This is what we observe. Um, so what, what does this really mean? So one um, hypothesis we have is that the information is probably not well maintained in resting state neuromagnetic signals. Again, long range temporal correlation, what, what is that? Actually, this is a measure based on detrended fluctuation analysis that we can run on the data, either the raw data or the uh, band past um, filtered data that tells us something about memory in the signal. So if you have a uh, high LRTC, you have persistent uh, information. And so there's long memory in your signal. And if it's low, then you have less memory in the signal. And so what we see is that there's a decrease in uh, persistency or in long range temporal correlations in schizophrenia patients. So the weaker temporal correlations more means also more irregularity in the signal. So it has less memory. And so this might be one way to tap into something we could call temporal disconnectivity rather than spatial disconnectivity in schizophrenia. Um, and obviously these types of results could help identify new biomarkers for early schizophrenia diagnosis. And more importantly, the reason I chose this is just one illustrative study. We've done this with other types of studies and other types of clinical data, just to show how machine learning can be leveraged to try and identify uh, features uh, that might be uh, turned at some point potentially into useful biomarkers. Again, to make sure I have time, I'm maybe not going to go through this in, in much detail. I would also say we have a recent other paper where we looked at uh, metrics of criticality in schizophrenia. Um, and I don't have time to, uh, to discuss this in detail, but again, here we use the same methodology where you can compute a feature. In this case, it's criticality um, uh, and multi, uh, using uh, multi self-similarity and multifractality of the MEG data signal. And then you can try, uh, you can run an algorithm and then you can look at the decoding accuracy of that algorithm across the brain and then run statistics on that to identify which brain areas were those features really relevant and could successfully classify between the two groups. Um, I mentioned earlier on the utility of transfer learning uh, as a tool for cognitive neuroscience. Um, and I'm just going to give here one example of a study that I think illustrates how this could be leveraged. Um, so we've run a study where we are comparing um, EEG recordings um, during wakefulness or during sleep. And 
the question we asked is, if we train a model to be able to separate EEG signals that come from an individual that is awake or that is asleep, um, can that model then be used and applied to uh, an individual that is going from wakefulness down to uh, anesthetically induced anesthesia or unconsciousness? Would that same model work? And if it does, does it work in specific areas? And what does that tell us about the similarity between falling asleep and falling into anesthesia? How does that change if you're using different anesthetics, propofol, civoflurane? Uh, and things like that. And, and so the main adaptation is a nice uh, ANN, so artificial neural network tool that can be used uh, to do this type of stuff. And we have a paper in, in, in prep that shows uh, feasibility of this. So there's a lot of other cool stuff that I didn't have time to tell you about, but that I'm very interested in. And we have a few studies, uh, including a study on creativity that we just published. Um, and now we're following up that with MEG data um, in the same uh, type of, of experiments. Uh, we have an ongoing study, it's actually nearly finished now, looking at the impact of caffeine on the neural activity during sleep and how that relates to the complexity of the brain signals and how does that impact uh, the quality of sleep. Um, we've been looking at meditation. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a study where we're looking at the effect of LSD. This is an MEG data set where we look at the effect of LSD compared to placebo on, placebo on brain networks, also leveraging machine learning for this. Um, we have a study on uh, the neural correlates of affective blind sites, and we're running uh, different types of machine learning algorithms for uh, neuronal fingerprinting. And I'd be happy to discuss that further. As I said, I'm here until June in, in LA. Uh, I'm in, um, working in uh, Richard's, uh, Richard Leahy's lab at the uh, Biomedical Imaging Group and collaborating with other neuroscientists uh, at USC. But I'm also very interested in, in, uh, in your collaborations. So with this, I would like to uh, acknowledge sources of funding I'd like to thank you for your attention. And um, that's it. Merci. Such a nice talk. Uh, any questions? Uh, Jesse raised his hand first. Sorry, Mark. Yeah, thanks for that very interesting tour of your work. Um, so two questions. But one uh, that I wanted to ask is can you sort of throw the, the EEG data at the deep learning model and use the raw data as opposed to like a Fourier transform spectral representation. And then you sort of did this method to figure out what was going on inside the black box. Do you feel like the deep learning model derived sort of the Fourier transform that it figured out that there's certain frequencies of signal that occur in the time series data, or is it doing something else? And like if you were to give it data that were already transformed into a spectral representation, so that's a very good question i think um I, i'm not sure it would do better with the features because in, so what we managed to extract from uh the analysis we did a posteriori afterwards to see what helped we we decided to do a spectral analysis and we saw that the uh, the uh, the sigma waves for instance were something that differentiates uh, are important for the segments that ha had a high degree of differentiation between the two groups. Uh, but that's our analysis. Uh, it still means that the algorithm identified that those segments are different, but it doesn't mean that it did a, a de facto uh, implicit Fourier transform. I don't think that's what it did, but it tells us that the Fourier transform is one way of tapping into the differences between those two segments. There might be other, um, um, other signatures for it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll let others have a question on chat, but Marco, you go first. Uh, great talk. Uh, the uh, one question is that your study on false reality reminds me of the famous new world study. And you guys did new world quantum life test and other life test for sensitive subjects in the gas. But what about those new world regeneration patients? Can you explain to me? That's a great question. I think we did try to look at that. Because this is SCEG, we were limited by how many electrodes happen to be. So, so we didn't have enough power, I would say, to say anything convincing. We saw, I think we did get excited at some point about some interesting results, but there's a limitation to what we can claim in seeing in like one or two individuals. Um, so ideally, we'd like, we'd, it would be nice to rerun this type of uh, analysis, either with a whole head type approach like MEG, for instance, or in a larger cohort of SCEG participants, where we have a lot of intracranial recordings with, with a better coverage of, of this area. But yeah, you're absolutely right. That would be nice to see. Uh, thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, I have a question. Uh, 
no, ideally you want to have as many uh, porting nodes as possible. Like in the EEG, for example, you have, I don't know, 100 or 60 or something like that porting sites. I'm wondering if there's any analysis of, you know, if you were to significantly reduce the number of reporting sites. Uh, for example, if you do like intracranial EEG, uh, maybe you only have four or eight reporting sites. Um, do you know if using the current methods that we have, our decoding accuracy would just go way down or would it be something similar? Has, uh, has there been any analysis of that? Um, so not that I know. The thing is, I think you cannot do it as a general rule, it's going to really depend on what type of task you have. So, for example, if you're trying to, let's say, take a super easy task, which is identifying if an individual is drowsy or, or awake, and you know there's a difference in alpha power in occipital parietal areas. So, all you need maybe is just one electrode that happens to be above occipital parietal areas. And you'll have probably a good discrimination because there's high signal to noise ratio. There's a strong difference between the power uh, in those two conditions. So, I don't think there's a general rule that will tell you. Um, how low can you go in terms of, of numbers? It really depends on what question you're, you're asking. Um, but there is some interesting venues for, for methodological work here where we could um, train an algorithm on, let's say, if you have access to MEG with 275 sensors um, and see how the performance changes on a specific, on a benchmark task to go take less and less uh, sensors, for instance, and see how far you can go. What you can also do is to see, can you actually uh, predict or can you go back to, if you have a low so for example we, we're doing work now where we're interested in using a mobile EEG headsets for naturalistic experiments so we're outside of the lab um, obviously EEG lab grade EEG is much better for whatever you want to do right but there are many tasks you can't do in that setting so one way is to see well can we try to learn can we train an algorithm to predict what would be the high density EEG version of the data we collect on a low uh, density commercial uh, or low cost EEG headset. So that I think something is also for the future. And that's something that we probably should be able to do with, with if we have good training data uh, using uh, deep learning. There's a question on chat. And if you want to actually read it or that would be great. Um, Just see if I have access. So, so the question is uh, DNNs are often data hungry. And EEG is often subject specific. So, how many subjects slash trials do you need to achieve high accuracy? Okay. Yeah, so this is similar to the question. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Uri, for that for that question. So um, I, I think there's no, again, rule of what is the minimal amount. Minimal, it also depends on how you split your data. For example, you could, um, you could have data points being an individual subject, but you could also, in some context, if you have 1,000 repetitions of a trial in each subject and you have 10 subjects, then you have 10,000 points that you could leverage. And then you could do leave subjects out so you can train on the 9,000 points from nine subjects and then see how well that generalizes to the 10th. That is one way, but you are in other contexts, you will actually be training on 600 individuals and then testing on, 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 on other individuals. And for each individual, it's just one point because you have, for example, the feature that you're looking at has to be average across all those trials. Uh, so there are really many ways that this can be approached. So there's, I don't think there's a rule that will give us a number. Um, and so, yes, causality and directionality is, uh, is also a very um, hot topic also in, in machine learning and AI at the moment. In terms of looking at um, these things from, uh, from a cognitive neuroscience uh, questions perspective, one approach is actually to compute connectivity as features. So you can compute the connectivity between different brain areas using things like uh, correlations if you're looking at fMRI or you can do um, Granger causality in particular, if you look at the causality between different brain areas, uh, specifically with electrophysiological data. Um, and then you can feed these, uh, this information into uh, a classifier and see how well that, uh, that works. There are also graph-based approaches that are now increasingly being used um, in, in AI and that are also being transferred to, uh, to brain imaging research where we use graph-based um, and neural graphs um, to do the analysis. 
Yeah, I think there was a, I hope that answers the questions of Yuri. I think there was a question here. Yeah, I had a very similar question based on the city, kind of what's happening. If you're seeing something in a paper like, you know, the classification accuracy of something in the high 90s, should I be like skeptical or? Yeah, great question. So to um, the, the first part of the question is, um, so it's, first of all, the, uh, the accuracy itself, I think there are ways to ensure it's, it's not about the numbers. So for example, if, if you have 67%, if your machine learning classifier gives you 67% and classifying the two groups, is that bad news? Or is that something publishable because it's above 50%? There are many ways of dealing with this. What, and one of them is just using statistics. So if you just mix your, 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 your labels and do permutation tests, you're going to get a, a nil distribution of decoding accuracy. And then you're just going to see whether your 67% actually fits in the 5% most rare cases, the highest cases. And if so, your 67% is statistically significant and you are able to report it. So I don't think it's the number, it's, it's actually making sure that it's statistically meaningful. Um, your first part of the question was, uh, Yes. So there, are, yeah. So there are, I think, um, some um, general guidelines for ensuring that you're not interpreting that come from machine learning um, uh, literature. One of them is typically what happens if you're overfitting is that you're going to get a high classification on the training set, and it's going to fail to generalize outside. So that's one way of looking at the um, to making sure that you're not uh, underfit. So so overfitting can also happen when you get a bad result. So if you say this is not working. Um, it probably it could mean that your algorithm is just doing so well at representing what's happening in training. It's, it fits the data like a glove. Now, if you come with your data that is slightly different from what you use for the training, now it's outside its distribution and it won't be able to generalize to it. So that's where you've overfit and your classification now should, goes down for the test step. Is, it there, is there also a risk of overfitting if you do lots of different cross-validations? So within each Yes. So, so technically, there are again. I think from from like a, a sound uh, machine learning perspective, there are things that people recommend to use to sort of avoid this type of, of uh, as a machine learning version of p-hacking, if you will. But basically, uh, one thing you can do is, for example, nested cross-validation. So for example, you'd be running all sorts of methods. You can also change the features that you want to use. You have feature selection that runs. Uh, you can also use different hyperparameters for your algorithms. But you do all of that in a nested cross-validation. So you, it's as if you have this regular cross-validation. We have training and tests. But then you take your training, and you split that again into a training and a, and a test. Now you can play around and you can, you're allowed to do all of these things and see what works best, right? You can do it because you're still in the training. Now, once you've found what works best on this, then you apply that to the test and that's it, but you can't go again. So, so basically I think one approach to that is uh, yeah, nested post validation. All right, so I, I just make one small comment. Uh, I think that there's a cross-validation doing all the accuracies, permutation testing, for instance, in terms of accuracy, not in terms of test, statistical testing. For deep learning, for all these machine learning things, it's, it's a computationally extensive process. Uh, how, how do you, do you have any ideas about that? I, I, I don't see people doing this. Yeah, so uh, we, we do so, but we do it mainly when we're using conventional statistics. So if you're using SVM or an LDA or a random forest, um, if you have access to clusters, that is something that you, that's easier and more tractable. Um, it's less common in, um, in the DL uh, world. That's right. So uh, let's thank uh, uh, Kari for joining us and for giving us all. Thank you for having me. So I think Kari will be here for a year. So if you guys want to reach out to him, Thank you. Switch this off.